Uh, welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Arjun Bridge Advisors, and thank you for spending a little time today with us. We created Coffee and Conversation as a way to bring relevant information to our clients and community, and we choose topics that we feel are educational and relate to financial planning, financial legacy planning, and longevity. Our job is not only to worry about the longevity of your money, but the longevity of our clients so that you can live full and happy, healthy lives. Last year, I attended a financial planning association meeting where I heard Dana Hudson first speak. And the reason for going to this presentation originally was a subject on ETFs, which was totally dull, but to my delight, I had the pleasure of hearing Dana speak. Dana is a community educator for the nonprofit Campaign Zero and the founder of Campaign, sorry, of founder of Cancer Champions. The sole purpose of Campaign Zero is to zero out preventable medical harm education. And one of the reasons why I was so attracted to Dana's talk was because I lost my own mother to cancer 14 years ago. And I remember as Dana was speaking, I was thinking, gosh, I wish I had thought about that or you know, had just had different way of caring for her when my mom was ill. So and we know that it's very stressful when you're caring for someone, whether it's a short term recovery from surgery or a long illness. And we just really hope to kind of relieve some of that stress for you. So today we'll be using the Q&A chat. So look for the double bubble on your screen. And at any time you have a question, just please pop it in there. Um, Dana's gonna be sharing some screen. She'll be sharing her screen with some slides and then I'll pop in um, to answer any of the questions. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dana. Thanks, Elise. And thank you everybody for taking the time out of your afternoon to come over and um, share with me. So let me get this into a, okay, can everybody see that okay? Elise, can you see that? Are we good? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so um, the, the title of this particular talk is just how to stay safe in the hospital and it's really protecting your most important asset, which is you, right? You guys are your most, important asset. And like Elise said, um, my name is Dana. I, a little bit about me, just briefly why I feel like I'm qualified to even speak on the topic. Um, the gentleman up here in the left-hand corner is my grandfather, and he was a physician. And for those of you in the DC metro area, um, you may be familiar with the old Lorton Penitentiary. It was a federal prison down here in Southern Fairfax County. My granddad was actually the prison doctor there in the 50s. And um, I was never afraid of the doctor's office. I always thought that I would actually follow in his footsteps and go into medicine. But then as I was going along that path in college, I met up with organic chemistry and it did exactly as it's supposed to do. And it weeded out the non-medical people. <laughs> so I continued my career um, in a marketing uh, capacity, but I never lost my desire for being around medicine and being around science. So I took my marketing business skills and I went to biopharma and spent the majority of my career um, with Genentech. And then my dad, the gentleman down here sort of laughing in the other corner, um, was diagnosed with a cholangiocarcinoma, which is a rare liver cancer. And it was during my dad's journey and our family's journey that my skills came into play to help our family navigate through all of that. And I wondered to myself, like, like Elise mentioned, how does anyone that doesn't have somebody in the family to turn to for things like that get through the confusion of a cancer diagnosis? So I quit my job at Genentech and I um, went and I became board certified as a private patient advocate. And now I have cancer champions and I help families navigate through the confusion of a diagnosis. And I was just sharing with Elise that I'm actually at my mom's house today. She's um, She's got lung cancer. And um, so I'm over here sitting in for her caregiver today. So I apologize up front if anything kind of out of the ordinary happens, <laughs> sorry. Um, today, though, I'm also representing Campaign Zero. I'm a community educator on their Speakers Bureau. And like Elise said, their number one mission is just to eliminate uh, patient harm and, and preventable harm in the hospital for patients, which is what we're going to talk about. It's really hard to believe that in the United States, um, preventable harm is the number three leading cause of death in, in this country. I mean, we're in, not in a third world country and still preventable adverse events in the hospital 
affect one in three of us needlessly. And the reason we say needlessly is these things should never happen. These are called, we call them never events. There are things like you may have heard of the superbugs, MRSA, uh, C. difficile, staph. There are medication errors that happen. There are pneumonias that happen, blood infections, falls, bed sores. None of this should happen in the hospital, but it does. And I'm gonna use a story to emphasize just sort of how things can go wrong quickly. So this is Sarah. Sarah is 68 years old. She's a grandmom. She obviously likes to bowl. And she was breaking in a new pair of bowling shoes and, and really getting her game going when she had a, uh, a shoulder injury. So she went to the orthopedist and the orthopedist said, don't worry, this is a routine injury. Lots of people your age get it. I'm going to, you know, we can do an outpatient surgery and I'll fix it. You'll be in and out same day. So Sarah said, great. You know, she wanted to hurry up and get back to her very busy, active life. So she went to the hospital and, um, it turned out while she was in the OR, it, the tear was a little more um, severe than they had anticipated. And so the surgery, she was actually in the OR for a couple hours longer than had anticipated, which meant she was under anesthesia for a little bit longer than they had anticipated. So when she was in post-op in the recovery room, um, they wanted to keep her just overnight because she was having a little bit of a issue coming out of the anesthesia. So they thought they'd keep her in the hospital just to be safe, just to be safe. So they put Sarah up on the floor and she's sleeping. She's still a little bit sedated and it's about four o'clock in the morning and she wakes up and she's a little disoriented because you know it was supposed to be an in and out surgery and now she's in the hospital. So she goes to get out of bed to, to walk to go to the bathroom and as she swings her legs over the bed and starts to get up, she loses her balance a little bit and gets sort of disoriented. And so she grabs for the side table, but like, what do we all know about those side tables in the hospital? <laughs> They're on wheels. So the table, as she was trying to get up, the table rolled away from her and she fell on the floor and hit her head um, and was on the floor, we're not sure how long before the nurse came in and found her. They got her back in bed. They sent her down for a CT scan just to be safe and just to see. And it did. they did come to find that she had a concussion. So they were going to go ahead and keep her one more night and then discharge her the next day. So the next day goes along and it's time for discharge. And as they're coming in to get her, she has, um, she's shaking and she has spiked a fever. They do a rapid blood test on her and find that she has a staph infection probably due to the fall that she had, and we're not sure how long she was on the floor, but she had an open wound on her heel because you know she had been breaking in these bowling shoes. And so she had a, a, a blister on her heel and they think that might've been the point of entry for the bacteria. So now she's gonna be put on a bunch of antibiotics. She's on a cocktail of antibiotics. Um, and as she's laying there, um, she has a reaction to the antibiotics and she has a hard time breathing. So she finds herself now in the ICU on a ventilator um, for a couple days. And they thought that maybe she wasn't gonna come out of the ICU. Luckily, um, she recovered, they put a different bunch of antibiotics on board. She, she recovered, but it was a very harrowing experience for her. And um, what was going to be just an outpatient overnight, you know, not even overnight, just an outpatient surgery to fix her sh shoulder where she was perfectly fine. Otherwise turned into this very harrowing event where she really could have lost her life. So I'm happy to say that she's fine and she's made a full recovery, but we want to say, why did that happen? Like, how does that happen? And there's a couple reasons for it. One, if you look at this picture over here to the left, this is taken early 1900s. And this is the way medicine used to be, right? We had one nurse to one patient. You had one physician who managed all of your care, who knew you very well. Um, and, and life was just much simpler as compared to the picture on the right where we have today. We have lots of technology. We have lots of sophisticated assays. We have bells and whistles and pumps and automation. And it's, it's very... Um, 
it's complex. It's very complex. And so we've lost some of the things that um, get lost in all that complexity are just simple things that we used to do back in the early 1900s that sometimes fall through the cracks now because we have so much complexity. So another component of that is patients forget 40% of what we hear when we're in the hospital. And I don't know how many of you have been to the physician and you go to your doctor's appointment and you come home and your spouse says, you know, how did it go? What did they say? And you're like, I, you know, I, I don't remember. I don't really remember. And that's normal. We don't remember. So that's part of the problem as well. So what does that mean for us, right? What it means is, is each of you can probably think of six people or so that would count on you to be maybe a care partner if they had to go to the hospital, right? I can think of people that would call me and say, hey, Dana, can you, can you go with me to the hospital? Out of those six people, if we know the statistics that I earlier cited, that one in three of us are gonna suffer from an adverse event in the hospital, which two of your friends would you choose to have that happen to, right? That, that's an absurd question. We're, nobody, we don't want anybody to um, suffer from the adverse harm of, of just a, something that can be prevented in the hospital. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about practical things that we can do as care partners for our loved ones when they have to go to the hospital. And we'll start with one of the things Sarah didn't do that she could have done. So if you have an elective procedure, say you're going to go and have a rotator cuff surgery or you have a knee replacement or something that you've elected to do, one of the things you can do is check out the hospital ratings, like find out how do they rate as far as infections and falls and how many of these surgeries have they done and who is the physician and are they qualified to do this case? There's several um, websites that you can look at that Campaign Zero has vetted. One is hospitalsafetyscore.org. The other one is hospitalcompare.gov and then consumer reports. Not to be confused with US News and World Report. And I'm sure y'all have seen on the outside of these hospitals, they'll hang these giant banners that say number one in you know US News and World Report or um, you might see the Washingtonian, right? And see and here for us in DC, we have, you know, the top docs of Washingtonian magazine. These, it's not that, it's not that they're, let's just say I wouldn't put all my eggs in these baskets because these are more of marketing channels for the physicians and for the hospitals. These um, surveys are done based on patient like satisfaction and patient satisfaction isn't always how well the outcome was for your, for your procedure. Patient satisfaction could just be you liked the food that they sent up from the cafeteria. So we don't really wanna put all of our eggs in these baskets as far as um, vetting our, our doctors and vetting our um, hospitals. So this is an example of the hospitalsafetygrade.org. This is a leapfrog as a, con, a healthcare consultancy. And this has been a very, this is a very useful site because you can put in your zip code up here and then you hit within 50 miles and it'll pop up all the hospitals that are within your radius. And then you can drill down and actually see how does that hospital rate when it comes to infections? How does it rate when it comes to fall risks? How does it rate for licensure? So it the leapfrog survey looks at those preventable harm, um, the preventable harm, the things that we want to avoid, and it rates the hospitals based on how well they do in erasing those preventable adverse events. Okay, so that's just an example of what that would look like. Okay, how this is so difficult when it's on Zoom. I, I'm such an extrovert and so much more love being in person, so I apologize that I'm going to kind of ask a question realizing I can't even see, see your answer. But um, how, how many people know what a hospitalist is? And I'm sure there's some of you that do, um, but many may not. So the hospital- I was gonna say, Dana, if anybody wants to put it, um, if they wanna put their answers into the chat, they're welcome to. Yeah, that, yeah that's great, guys. Um, 
Uh-huh. And I will say that I didn't know what it was until I heard you speak before. Okay, so I'm going to assume there's a couple other folks that maybe don't know what this is. So the hospital is, and just to share that I'm going to date myself, but back in the day um, when I was you know, working in pharma, a hospitalist would be the guy that really didn't do so well in residency and wasn't going to be able to really cut it in private practice or wasn't picked up by one of the big practices. Um, And so they'd go to the hospital and they'd work in the hospital. And the hospitalist back then was just sort of an ancillary person to be there when everybody else couldn't be there. Well, we have flip-flopped. So now the hospitalist is the quarterback. The hospitalist is the person that is running the entire case for you when you're in the hospital. Your primary care doc, your internist, those guys don't even have hospital privileges anymore. So those guys and gals don't, don't see you at all when you're in the hospital. Now they may talk to the hospitalist, maybe, but they're not rounding on you. They're not coming in to see you. It's the hospitalist that's doing everything. So, and depending on the size of a hospital, there may be one hospitalist taking care of 23 people at a time, okay? So there, it's not an intimate relationship with these people. And a lot of times we, we rely so much on electronic medical records and we think, oh, well, you know, all my stuff is in the electronic medical record. The hospitalist should just be able to pull it up and see and know everything about me. Unfortunately, anybody that does software and knows software and and like works with the government knows about integration. We have all of these sites that have all electronic medical records, but they're not all necessarily talking to each other. So the point of all of this is if you're the care partner in the hospital, you may be the wealth of information for the hospitalist to be able to fill him or her in on your loved one about their medical history and and everything about them. So we wanna get to know the hospitalist. You wanna know who they are, you want their card, you want their phone number, okay? Everybody now that's been in the hospital recently has seen there's a big whiteboard at the foot of the bed that says, you know, what's the plan for today or some such thing, what are the patient goals, What are, this is all part of that patient satisfaction. You want to make sure the patients are being heard, but it really can be a wealth of information for a care partner because on the board, you will see um, what their plans are, what tests they're planning on, on ordering for your loved one. You can see oftentimes when the tests are scheduled, you can see the drugs that have been ordered. You can see um, the different, um, healthcare providers that are are scheduled to come in or on your loved one's case. So use the board as as information, but also use the board to make sure that you share the goals of your loved one. You know, what are their goals and what are their questions and what are your questions? So just as much as it's information for you, it also should be a vehicle for you to jot down information for them. And you can use it um, as a reminder, right? As a reminder of things that you want to, to talk about. But what really you need to do is just is take notes. Um, if you are the care partner, you want to take notes and you want to take good notes either this way old fashioned pen and paper it's my it's my preferred note taking way i just like it um you could use your phone you could use uh, a tablet whatever you feel comfortable with but take notes and when i say take notes i mean almost like a steno in the in the courtroom like you want to know who's coming into the into the room you want to know why they're there you want to know you know what drugs are they talking about you want to know what notes we'll talk about what kind of notes to take as we go along one of the first things you want to do is keep track of who is who so um, remember we talked about things have gotten complex you may have nutritionists, you're gonna have the janitor and housekeeping, you're gonna have um, nurses, you're gonna have nursing techs, you're gonna have specialists, you may have a surgeon, you may have a infectious disease doctor, a neurologist, a OT, a PT, like you could have up to 10, 11, 12 people coming into your loved one's room on any given day or over the course of their stay. And you don't know, your loved one certainly doesn't know who they are, Um, but you need to keep track of who they are and find out why they're there and what is their role in the health, in the team. What, What is their role? And get their card. Almost all of them have a card. If they don't have a card, they have a cell phone. So get their cell phone number. 
You also want to keep track of medications. So this is important because, I mean, we all have the wristbands, right? Your, your loved one will have the wristband on and they'll scan the wristband every time they bring in a new med and they'll ask your loved one, you know, what's your name? What's your birthday? And it might get annoying for your loved one. My dad, when he was in the hospital, about, it was probably about day three and um, they were coming in and they were scanning and he looked at me and he was, damn Dana, these people don't even know my name and I've been here for three days and they keep asking me my name. And, you know, I said, daddy, it's redundancy. It's, it's safety. They're doing it for a reason. So we're just going to let them keep doing it. And they're doing that to make sure that the right patient is getting the right drug and they're, they're getting the right dose and at the right time and the right route. So all that means is um, you as a care partner, you can ask, what is that that you're giving them? And you keep track of why they're getting it. And I like to use an example of pain meds. A lot of times um, somebody will be on pain medication and it's scheduled for the time to be every like four to six hours. But if your loved one starts to get really fidgety and is getting short of breath and is feeling very uncomfortable at three and a half hours, you don't have to wait till hour six for when the nurse is going to come back in, right? You can start to ask, hey, I think the pain is starting to break through. Could somebody please come in and, and like, let's get on this, the pain medicine. So that's where you can help with things like that. You also wanna keep track of the tests, like what tests are being ordered. You wanna ask them, why is it being ordered? What time do you think that it's gonna be, they're gonna come get them? Uh, the radiology department can come get people at nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. I think my dad went down for a scan one time at midnight. So you wanna ask when, when are they coming? Why are they doing it? And what results, when can we expect the results? And that's important because sometimes results, remember we forget 40% of what we hear. So somebody needs to be in the room with your loved one when you get the results so you can, so you can be writing these things down, right? And this is sometimes what the results sound like. So they come in and they say, you have blah, 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 blah. Well, physicians are like everybody else. If you're in a, you know, a a profession, you have a vernacular and you use it all the time with people. So you just forget that somebody might not understand your acronym or understand your, ver your words. So it's important for you as the caregiver and the patient, if you don't understand what they're saying, it's okay to just say, I'm sorry, could you please explain that to me like I was in sixth grade? Because I, I don't understand what you're saying. And it's imperative that you understand what they're saying. So don't let a caregiver leave until you have a complete understanding of what it is that they are talking about. And I have so many clients that cancer in particular has its own set of its own language. And I have so many clients that will just nod their head and then ask me, what did they just say? Um, because you, one, you just, you feel intimidated by the white coat and two, you kind of don't want to admit that you don't know what they're saying, but why should you know what they're saying? This is not your field of expertise. So go ahead and ask. Now, in um, the time of COVID, everybody knows this now, but you would be amazed at how many people don't wash their hands. Um, when they enter a hospital room. And you want everybody that comes into that room to wash their hands. I don't care if it's the janitor or the nutrition guy bringing the tray from the cafeteria, you want them to use that antimicrobial soap at the door before they come in. Um, and if it's a physician that didn't wash their hands, it's okay to say, excuse me, could you just wash your hands? Cause they forget too. Um, you want to wash your hands because you're touching your loved one. So you want to make sure you wash your hands. And I also um, suggest you bring a, a, your own antibacterial soaps with you, the little, you know, Purells and things, because you want to wash your loved one's hands. Because think about it, they're touching the bed rail, they're touching the remote, they're touching um, the telephone, and then they're touching their face or they're touching, you know, where there might be an IV line and, and that's all not good. So you want to make sure that everybody's washing their hands. I can't emphasize that enough. And you also want to, we've learned with COVID, right? We want to wipe things down. So alcohol kills things, bleach kills things. So bring your own Clorox bleach with you and bring some gloves with you. And when you wipe, wipe off the tray. One way, pull up another wipe and wipe it the other way. Don't do this. 
this is not good. This is just spreading things all around. So I see people in the grocery store now doing this all the time. And I'm like, oh, no, don't do that. Just wipe it one way. Um, but you want to wipe everything down. The, anything that is that your loved one may touch, you want to be wiping it down. We, like Sarah, right? She was not feeble. There was nothing wrong with Sarah. She wasn't decrepit, but she was a fall risk in the hospital because when you're sometimes in a room for a long period of time, you start to lose your bearings sometimes, or if you've been sedated, or just sometimes the, the antibiotics that you're on make you a little woozy. So don't get up and start trying to walk around without somebody there to help you, whether it's a nurse, whether you call a nurse, or your loved one that's there as your care partner can help you. And wear the slippy socks. My dad would be like, I'm not wearing those socks. I'm like, oh, yes, you are. We're wearing the socks. And if somebody, if you use a cane at home, then you want a cane in the hospital. And if you don't have one with you or you left yours at home, PT department has plenty of canes. You just ask your nurse that you need a cane and they will get you one or any other durable medical equipment that you might need, a walker, whatever you might need. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about alarms because it's, they're important. It's very noisy in the hospital. Now, remember the picture with all the equipment that was earlier on in this presentation? That's where we are now. We've got all kinds of, I mean, the, the nursing station now looks like they are about to launch, you know, a rocket. It's like NASA. Um, so sometimes you want to bring an earplugs or an eye mask for your loved one if they're light sleeper so they can get some rest because you're healing, you're only healing when you're resting. Um, and you want to be the bad guy, like be the one to manage the visitors. You know, I don't, if they all come and they're like, oh, but we, we're just, we've drove an hour. Like, well, I'm sorry, they're resting right now. So maybe you could wait until, and obviously this is pre COVID because now only one person can get in at a time if you're lucky, but this is when we go back to some normalcy. Now, something about alarms. So alarms are going off all the time and there's alarms for pulse, you know, for oxygen, you've got alarms for heart stuff. You've got alarms for when the IV stops dripping. There's just all kinds of alarms. When you hear an alarm, get a nurse to come look at it when you're the loved one. Even if you don't think it's an important alarm, let's say you've been there five days and you know when the IV stops dripping, it's going to make this bonking noise. That's fine, but you still want to get somebody to, to come. Do you have a question, Elise? Yeah, someone asked, uh, will the hospital charge you for durable equipment? No, they mm -mm, not if you're using it while you're in the hospital. They, they won't. It, mm -mm. Most, of, most of the time, just tell me you need to borrow it. Like just tell me, and well, and it's a good question. I'm, I'm using the Innova system. I don't know like nationally if a hospital would. So a good question would be, is this going to be a charge for me or can I just borrow one until I get the one from home? So that is a good question. I, um, I know locally here they don't, but I can't speak for the whole country. So does that, I hope that answers the question because it's just why you're using it in the hospital. It's not something that you're going to take home, right? Um, and if you needed durable medical equipment at home and you don't have it, I'll address that in a few more slides. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. So the, um, I'm just going to tell a story about this alarm because it's kind of important and it, 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 it highlights the importance of paying attention to alarms. Nurses have this thing called alarm fatigue. Um, it's almost like white noise to them. And a lot of times an alarm can be going off and a nurse just doesn't really hear it, if that makes sense. And so you can never really just assume, oh, well, they hear that they're coming because they might, they might not. And the case in point, there's a, a woman um, who's a friend of the Campaign Zero executive director, and she's a nurse and her 50 year old husband went in for just a routine hernia repair. Um, he went into the hospital, it was gonna be in and out. And while he was in recovery, after he'd been through the surgery, she talked to the nurses and she said, how long do you think he's gonna be here? And they said, probably a couple hours. So she was gonna to run to the grocery store to get whatever supply she needed to, before to take him home, right? So the time that she's at the hospital or at the uh, grocery store, while she's doing that, he, the husband, aspirates while he's in recovery, which just means he sort of, he sort of had some, some vomit right, while he was coming out of anesthesia and his 
oxygen alarm started going off and nobody attended to it um, until it was too late. By the time they got to him, he had choked and, and he had suffocated um, and died. And, and she comes back from her grocery run and her 50 year old husband who just went in for a routine hernia surgery was dead. And it just, it only takes two minutes to suffocate. So when these alarms start going off, you want to get somebody. That's my point. Okay. And, and, and they're, they really do. Sometimes the nurses don't hear it. Um, I'm sure lots of people have heard, don't be in the hospital over the weekend if you can help it. And there's, there's a reason for that. So the reason is it's a skeletal staff. Um, remember we talked about like the hospitalist is in charge of everything. And on the weekend, you don't have all these other extraneous specialists in the building. Like you don't have the neurology people and all, you know, all the specialists that come in to see people, they're not around on the weekends. So you want to make sure that if you can schedule a non, a non um, emergency surgery Tuesday or a Wednesday, so you can be out by Friday. Um, if you have to be in there over the, over the weekend, you want to talk to the doctors before the weekend comes, all the specialists, all the people have their numbers in your notebook, have, have how you can contact them over the weekend and ask them what you should be looking for. Like when, when should I call you? What should I be looking for? And if you can arrange for a 24 seven, somebody to be with your loved one, to, to be with them overnight. I mean, I'm talking spend the night. Um, with COVID, it's very difficult because nobody's letting us spend the night. What you can ask for is a sitter. Not all the hospitals, it'll depend on the capacity that they have and how many people, how much staff they have and how full the hospital is. But if you ask in advance, like if you asked them on Wednesday for a sitter on Friday, you probably can get somebody and it's typically a tech or a, a nursing student or somebody that will sit with your loved one by the bedside and listen for the monitors and help them when they have to go to the bathroom and keep things wiped down and do all of those things that you would be doing if you were there. So that's, and there's checklists that anybody that is volunteering to be with your loved one in this capacity, you can make sure that they have so they know what to look out for and, and how to be helpful. Okay, this one. This one is worth like even just tuning in for today because I'm going to tell you guys something that nobody knows. Um, I had a nurse on a call um, last week and she's like, oh my gosh, Dana, I didn't even know that. So back in 2015, I think it was, um, they instituted this, this national thing and it's essentially calling a 911 call within the hospital. So if you're in the hospital with your loved one and things just start going badly and you know your loved one more than anybody right you know them better than anybody if you feel like their condition is really going downhill quickly i mean i'm talking this is bad this is not just you know a car this is bad and you're not getting anybody to come help you nobody's coming to help you you can pick up the phone at the bedside dial zero tell the operator i'm calling a condition help in room 444 for john doe and there will be a uh, lickety split medical team at the door very quickly to, to find out what's happening. You're essentially calling a code, if you've ever been in the hospital and heard when they call a code, at your, your loved one's bedside. So obviously, this is not something we use unless it's a dire, dire life or death emergency. And it is pretty dramatic. Um, if you don't really feel comfortable with that much power and you don't really wanna be the one to do that, or you're not sure, like, I think this is really bad, but I'm not really sure. And I don't know if it's bad enough to do this condition help thing, I don't know. You can stick your head out into the hallway at the nurse's station and say, I'm considering calling a condition help in here. I'm thinking about it and they will be there because no nurse wants a condition help called on her floor during her shift ever. So um, it's to be used very sparingly and seriously only like in a life and death situation. The other piece that I like to bring up is how many times have you been with a loved one in the hospital? This happened with my mom actually. Um, and she was in there for like 10 days and she just started to get a little um, cognitively impaired. 
and they they immediately because you think about it the hospitalist doesn't know your parent you know doesn't know your loved ones the nurses really don't know your loved ones you are the one that knows and i know she was cognitively completely sharp before this hospital stay it's not dementia but a lot of them will start going down the dementia road as they're trying to figure out why your loved one maybe is losing some of their cognitive ability it's don't you don't need to just agree with them like just say no you know i think that it's probably she was fine when she came in here could it be and these are some of the things at the bottom like could it be an infection could it nine times out of ten it's a urinary tract infection they could be having a um a reaction to narcotics there could be a medication error they could be having a reaction to medications it could just be that they've been in the hospital room for too long without sort of getting out and about and they've lost their circadian rhythms and they're just a little off. So don't just say, oh yeah, yeah, let's start treating or get the psych in and let's start to, no, ask for some tests first before we go down that road. And then I also just um, would say support the nurses as best you can. Like they juggle so much and 25% of the time when somebody dings that call bell for a nurse, this is if we were in front of each other, I'd ask you what you think it's for. I'll just have to tell you now, 25, one out of four. So every time that somebody dings, they are asking to either get the remote control for them, change the TV channel for them, get their glasses. They can't reach their glasses. It's something like not medically related. It's something, you know, that a care partner could do. If you were there, you could do it. So you want to then think about these nurses that are taking care of eight to 10 people at a time. So think of all the times they're getting dinged so they can have their blanket pulled up or something. And that's not to say those things aren't important for our loved ones, but it's maybe not something that the nurse should be doing, right? We want her to be making sure she's administering the right medicine and paying attention to alarms, right? That's what we want her to be doing. So ask her how you can help her. Um, let her know you've got checklists. Show her the, the Campaign Zero checklist. Campaign Zero does a lot of education in hospital systems with nursing staff. And just say, how can I help you? Like, can I take some of this off your plate? So then we're going to talk about discharge. Um, there's a lot of room for error and confusion at discharge. So you wanna have that notebook that you've been keeping now throughout the course of the stay. You've taken notes on like the medications, what durable medical equipment that you think you might need at home. Um, you've taken care of um, what kind of OT is gonna look like, what PT is gonna look like. Is my loved one going home? Are they going to a, a rehab center? Are they going to an assisted living? All of these questions, this is the time to get all of your questions answered. And the discharge nurse, sometimes, I mean, I'm just gonna be honest, there's some really great ones and there's some really bad ones. So if you get a really great one, good for you. If you get a bad one, you're just gonna to have to keep on them until they give you the information that you need to be able to transition your, your loved one's care at home. Sorry about that, that's bad. Um, okay. This is an, just a, and back to the durable medical equipment. So those are when you're asking, let's say you do need a wheelchair at home or you need um, a porta potty at home or you need something at home. That's a question for the discharge nurse to be, is this gonna be covered by my loved one's insurance? Or is there a, some, some plan with the hospital where I can rent the equipment? That's the time to ask those questions. Medicare usually covers most of the DME. Um, Home health, this is just a, an example of what a home health referral will look like. So in this particular instance, um, the doctor ordered skilled nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, some home health. This is all of these things. And then the discharge nurse is the one that helps you get all these things. Like they'll give you lists of assisted living places and they'll give you lists of home health places and occupational therapists. And But you're going to have to make the decision. They're not going to tell you which is the best. They can't. So you're going to have to do some research on your own to figure out which one you want to go to, but they will give you the resource. And they'll also give you the durable medical equipment, right? They'll, they'll do that order for you. I'm just going to put a plug in here. If you aren't familiar with all of these items or you don't really know how to begin to vet an occupational therapy rehab center or a assisted living center or home health, I mean, there's so many home health companies, 
it might be a good time to call a private advocate, right? Because we have resources, we have ways of vetting people, we have um, tools that can help you to sort of discern that information so you can get everything pulled together. So once your loved one gets home, you wanna make sure that you're checking in with them for at least 30 days um, once they get home. And the reason for that is sometimes we get discharged too quickly. And actually, I'm gonna go back. If, if in fact you feel your loved one is not medically strong enough to be at home, um, and this doesn't mean that like, oh, you don't have the hospital bed yet, so they can't come home. It's not that. It's, it's more of you just physically don't feel like they are able to be at home. My mom came home too soon, and this was on me, um, came home too soon after she had had a, a pain issue. And we thought the pain was under control, but it wasn't. And we bounced right back and went to the ER the very next day. You want to avoid that for a lot of reasons. So if you feel like it's too soon, you can tell the discharge planner or the nurses before you get to discharge, you know what, I'm going to appeal the discharge. I want to appeal it. And then that buys you 24 hours because then they have to file paperwork and go to the insurance company and try to see if they can get another extra day out of the insurance company. But it'll buy 24 more hours of your loved one actually being supported in the hospital if you feel like that would be beneficial for their health, not, not for logistics, but for their health. Um, but if they do get home, when you, they do get home, check on them every 30 days. They, they could be, um, if they had a lot of antibiotics in the hospital, they, their gut, their could be rearranged enough, the flora in their gut, that they now have a C. diff infection that maybe won't manifest itself until you know a week later. So you wanna be asking the doctor, what should I be looking for? And if your loved one spikes a fever, call the primary care, call the physician, because a lot of times they can just order a course of antibiotics and that'll take care of it. And then you won't have to bounce back in the hospital. And it's okay to ask for help. Um, a lot of us feel like it's a sign of either weakness to ask for help, or we feel like we're the daughter or we're the son and we should be the ones doing the help. Um, you need to ask for help because if you use some of the help that's available, then, then you can be the daughter and you can be the son and you don't have to be the, the caregiver. Um, it's, it's just, it's okay to ask for help. And there's lots of, of people. Um, there are apps that can help you stay organized. You've got friends and family. And again, a private advocate is a great way to um, unload some of these scheduling and organizational things. So you can go ahead and just enjoy being the person that you are in the family. Campaign Zero, this is who I'm representing today. When you go to campaignzero.org, you can download uh, safety checklists. So this is one, uh, just an example. This is would be a checklist on how to prevent medical uh, medication errors, medication mix-ups. She's got checklists in there on how to prevent infection, how to prevent falls, um, all kinds of checklists, right? You would get it just up here under your safety checklist. And the next one, she's got a surgery safety checklist where you can get, like this would be an example of what Sarah maybe could have done um, to do some vetting before she went to the hospital. And this particular one that's pulled down just tells you like, these are the things, this is what to communicate at the hospital for your loved one on the day of surgery. So that's, that's all the information. It's a lot. I know I just probably gave you guys a lot of information. And I told Elise, um, I will be sharing these slides on, in a handout form that'll have all the information as far as, you know, some of the websites that I, that I talked about and things. Um, so you have them. And you can always just reach out to me if you have additional questions. But thank you for listening. And Elise, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you Dana. This is fantastic. And if anyone has any questions, please um, put them in. But I'm going to, um, well, first, if you don't mind, just stop sharing your screen so people can see your face. Oh, my face. And I actually have a question. Sure. And that is what's happening with COVID. And obviously, we're, you know, we're looking at who knows, but maybe, you know, another year to two or whatever until hospitals kind of get back to where we feel there's ability to have, family, you know, multiple family members. What are you finding that's different right now? And what kind of advice can you give us to, you know, communicate with the staff and doctors, things like that. Yeah, that is, I just had a, a client, um, well, it depends on, okay, let's back up. 
depends on where we are, right? ANOVA is letting, for if you, so if you're in the DC area, like most of the hospital systems around the DC area are allowing one family member and they've got a compressed amount of time that they're letting, you know, that you can come in. You just have to be COVID, not, not have any symptoms and not have a fever and then you can go. So in that instance, when you are allowed to be in there, I absolutely would have the notebook and like, and go in prepared, like not even just going in, like just to say, hi, how are you doing? I'm going to bring you a milkshake, whatever. Go in with your, your list of questions that you need answered. Try to find out as much information while you're in there. Who's the case manager? Who's the nurse on, you know, who's going to be the nurse on call on the floor for that night? What's the hospitalist number? What's their name? And get, you want to get all of that information because once you're back on the outside, that's the only way you're going to be able to communicate with anybody. And you don't want to have to rely on your loved one because they're forgetting 40% of what they hear. Right. And they're not necessarily able to get everybody's numbers and everything. So that's my biggest thing is when you do go in, make sure you're very strategic about what you're doing when you're in there. Um, if you can't get in, uh, there's a couple things you can do. If you're not, if you're, if you're calling the nursing station and you're not getting anybody to, to respond, or you're calling your loved one's room and you're not getting anybody to respond, uh, call patient relations in the, the hospitals. All the hospitals have a patient relations. Uh, it's, it's like the advocates within the hospital for the patients. Now, they're not like me. They're not a private advocate. They work for the hospital, but they are there to make sure that the patients and their loved ones are having a good experience. Okay, so if, if you can't get a hold of somebody, call patient relations. And if that doesn't work, um, then I would escalate it up to a, a private advocate, you know, or somebody that knows how to work the system and can get in there and get the, the answers that you need. Um, there was one other thing that popped into my head and then it just went right back out. That happens to me these days. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just getting, getting information while you're, while you're in there. So you know who to call and, and how to navigate. Oh, I know what I was going to say. And when you do get the case manager's name or while you are in there, make sure on that whiteboard, make sure your phone number is written on that whiteboard very clearly with your name and with a direction that you want to be included in any health care discussion that happens at your uh, loved one's bedside. Because in the time of COVID, it is perfectly reasonable for them to call you on their cell phone and merge you in. So you can be sitting there during that call and you can ask questions and, and you can hear exactly what your loved one is hearing. Yeah, those are great suggestions. I really appreciate that. Um, that was my own personal question. But if anyone has any others that they want to ask, please do. Um, you know, just to kind of wrap things up, you know, obviously, Dana, thank you so much for your time and everybody that joined us today, joining Argent Bridge Advisors today. But um, hopefully this is information that's helpful to you. I will definitely send out a follow-up email that will have the slides, the resources, the link. So if you took great notes, I see someone just popped a question in. Um, somebody asked, do you have resources for finding a primary care physician? Yes, there are none on Campaign Zero's site because they, she's more about just checklists and things for a hospital and for finding a surgeon because usually surgeons operate, you know, right within the hospitals. But if you, um, Elise, if you send me that person of who, you know, who that is, I'll send you, I'll send you a resource on how to vet a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I believe that person's local and I have a great primary physician that I like. So I'm more than happy to share that um, information as well. So. Honestly, that's one of the best ways to find a, a doctor too, is to ask around, right? Not just what you see on websites and what you see, but also to um, talk to people. And when it comes to my primary physician, I want them to either be my age or younger. Yeah. <laughs> so that just kind of makes sense that they, you know, kind of, you know, they don't retire when, when right. I need them the most. Right. So. Right. Um, anyway, like I said, I was going to, I'll be sending out all the resources of information to everybody in an email. And all of our webinars are recorded on our website, on our events page. So if you want a family member or a friend to view today's presentation, just check back in a couple of days, give me a chance to get it up on the website. And, um, or if 
it was a lot of information to absorb today. So sometimes you have to kind of go back and hear something again. Someone just asked, I have a family member who sent who was sent home after hip surgery with 12 different meds. Do you have strategies for managing medications after discharge, different times, dosage needs and things? That is, oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Because like, two things on that. One, when you're in the hospital, and, and I know maybe you didn't do this now, so but this is just for future, that is a really good time to do a medicine, like a medication reconciliation is what they call it. You can ask a pharmacist while you're in there to do, I need to do a, med a medication reconciliation because what happens is our medical record just builds and builds and builds and builds. So now any medicine that they put into your loved one's medical record for this hip replacement, it might be medicine they don't need, you know, in, in two months. But then if they go to the doctor for something else in two months, that medicine is still in their record. And so it, they just roll on and on and on. So you don't, you don't necessarily need that. So you can clean that up. So that's just for starters, just to, to make sure for now, um, any of those pill, the first thing that I do, I'm just old fashioned, write it down. I just put it down either in a spreadsheet or on a piece of paper of just the schedule of when everything is to be taken, the dose and everything. And then I put it in a, um, in one of the pill, those pill organizers, you can get them at all the different drug stores. You also, some of the pharmacies now will do, if you take all of your, um, it's like innovation pharmacy, I can send this Elise, I'll send you the information. Some of the pharmacies can take all of that, um, all of those prescriptions and they put them in pill packs. So they can actually do all the hard work for you. So then it, you just give a pill pack a day and you don't have to worry about all of that because the, the pharmacy goes ahead and does it all for you. So I can send you that information as well. And they, most of them will do that um, for no charge. Okay, and I, I didn't know that. That's a great suggestion. Uh, someone asked, Does, uh, do your suggestions work for ER visits when one is not admitted, but instead ignored for long periods of time until discharge? Or is that a different lecture? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they do work. I mean, the whole, maybe, maybe you're not, yes, I mean, maybe you're not as worried about, you know, uh, wiping things down and washing hands and all of that. When it's an emergent situation like that and nobody is paying attention to you, as the care partner, your whole job is, is just to be the greasy wheel. It, it's just, if you are not getting in, and you can escalate that up to say you want to talk to a patient relations person, or you want to talk to the nursing supervisor, or you want to talk to the, you know, the physician that's in charge, like just keep escalating things up politely, politely. Um, and if you feel, I mean, the, the condition help that that's going to work no matter where you are. So if you're in a bay in a hospital, you know, in the ER and you feel like it is really dire, then I would just pull my head out and say, I'm going to call a condition help in here. I need some, you know, and, and they'll, they'll pay attention. So the biggest thing in the ER is just to, to just, there's a fine line between being polite, right? You want to be polite and respectful of their training and their job but you also are there to be the voice of your loved one. So you want to, you know, I just had a client, I just talked to a client um, yesterday who had a, um, their loved one had special needs and was having seizures and things. And the nurse practitioner at the house at the ER was horrible and just dismissed and disregarded, sent the person home too soon. And not within five hours, they were back in the ambulance because they'd had another seizure. Now they're admitted on the mm -hmm. neuro floor. So it's, it's, you have to, you have to, you have to be bold. You have to be your own advocate in these. You situations. have to be bold. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I think that might be it. Again, thank you, Dana, so much. And as I said before, just give me a couple of days to get this on the website because I feel like a lot of information and we want to go back in and um, hear things again. And then for anyone out there, we are always looking for great webinar ideas. So if there's something, subject matter you want to hear more about, let me know and I will do the best to make it happen. And in the meantime, be well, stay healthy and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Elizabeth. Dana. Thank Bye. you.